Huh? Is it working? Yeah, okay. It was always on my bucket list to wear one of these headsets, so that's <laughs> great to have that. Good morning. Uh, hope you're doing well. I heard that some of you went to a drag queen bar yesterday. I hope you returned all well. And um, <laughs> that, that um, uh, in case I, I, I talk too fast, please let me know. Oh, and uh, now the connection is skipped. That's perfect. That's like in university back in the days. All right. It's as it is um, uh, connecting. I, I, you already heard. It. I want to talk about um, a new form of storytelling in, in journalism. I want to talk about um, how uh, which challenges this means in the world that is completely changing. And uh, it says, it's, "I'm sorry." Uh, is it? Also, is it? Yeah. Maybe the connection isn't. There. No, now it's worth. <coughs> All right, let's get started. Otherwise, uh, before it ends. All right. So um, you, you already heard about me. What what I'm doing? I'm working in a in a little um, unit in a, that does documentary films. And within this unit, I'm working for a unit that is called the Box. And we are thinking of uh, new ways to produce and uh, uh, to, to 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 share our content eventually to gift wrap it so that a younger audience will find it. It's not working, I don't know, is it maybe, I'm sorry, it was working all the whole time. Can you, can you, like, I just need, all right, okay, now, uh, yeah, it, it might be, I'm sorry. So, we, we've got that, and uh, the reason why I'm here is that uh, last fall I was given a, a grant by IGIP, that's International Journalist Program, um, to visit and report on new forms of storytelling in the U.S., and um, that led me to think tanks and all kinds of different um, um, places, uh, game uh, developers, startups, and uh, yeah. And uh, one thing of this is uh, called storytelling that I did. I spent there two months uh, reporting, and you, it was uh, broadcasted on TV, and it was on the major news sites, uh, Tagesschau.de, and you can still see it. All right. So uh, all I did is uh, that's just uh, some some uh, smaller part was all done with an iPhone. So that's also a trend you'll face in, in journalism that more and more journalists start using these small devices to report on. And I wanted to be flexible, and so all you're going to see was actually shot with that. So let's talk about journalism in these days. Um, journalism is in in a deep crisis. Um, it's not a sudden death or old school journalism. Um, in a, in fact. Um, what, what we see is that um, there's a disrupted market. Uh, you see all kinds of new players in the game. Um, it, it becomes increasingly important to get on the home screens to have smart libraries for, uh, for broadcasters, especially for us as public ones that are uh, facing the problem that younger generations bow out of that uh, linear consumption. And therefore, it becomes increasingly important to to be there, and uh, so that's that's one part. And on the other hand, we see that people are becoming more and more skeptical about the so-called established press. Um, what we see here is a poster saying "Lügenpresse." It's uh, German, and it means that the press is lying. We see that more and more people are getting skeptical. You see in social media, it's 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 some kind of an accelerator for. Um, all kind of conspiracy theories and people are more and more people are presuming that uh, we the established press are some kind of twisting reality that we are um, uh, that we are censored by the government and stuff like that and um, on the other hand there have been failures by ourselves um, when uh, reporting because of course we do uh, we're just humans we we do fail and um, if you look at the, at the Ukraine-Russian crisis um, and the, uh, the refugee crisis uh, happening, uh, the problem is not that there were failures happening when reporting on it, but the problem was that we weren't transparent and fast enough. So that kind of helped people to, to doubt um, whether this is the, the, the right uh, thing um, going on. It's really... <laughs> okay. So. Um, but there's another truth as well, that's, it's, uh, that there's a gold rush as well in journalism. And um, that's happening at the same time. And um, 
it's uh, on the one hand side we see that the old media houses they have huge problems, financial problems, especially when it comes to newspapers. Um, but on the other hand, we see that there are new players in the game. You see that Facebook and uh, YouTube, they, they, they suddenly become interested in journalistic content and pumping millions of, of dollars in all kinds of products that can be also used for, um, for journalism. And um, there's some, when it comes to, to virtual reality, I'll be uh, talking about virtual reality later. But uh, looking at this topic, you can see how all <laughs> it's great, uh, uh, how all different kind of industries are suddenly interested in a field that can also be used for journalism. So um, uh, luckily, old school press is changing as well. Um, uh, this is um, at New York Times. They they uh, have on the one hand hand they have put a huge amount of money in virtual reality. Uh, for, for, for journalism in virtual reality, but they are also working on uh, new forms uh, of, 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 of articles. Alexis Lloyd, who is uh, working at the New York Times Research and Development uh, Department, says that the future of news is not an article, and that means that they are uh, trying to, to customize articles so that it fits uh, to your education, to your, to your knowledge, uh, to, to what you've been reading before and of course this means which might also be a problem um, that you have to gather a lot of information before so uh, let's hear what um, she uh, Alexis Lloyd has to say about virtual uh, sorry about uh, the future is not an article If I, uh, if I know all about what's happening in Syria, because I've read lots of stuff about Syria, that when I come back, I just get the updates. I just get the information about what's happened since I last, since I last read about it. But that if I'm new to the topic, that I get a lot more background. All right, so, um, so that's just one example uh, how there's actually a gold rush in, uh, new, of new ideas in journalism after a huge disruption. So uh, what it's all about, um, I think that um, in the future, more than ever before, journalists will have to rely on two tools, which is on the one hand side, it's empathy, and um, on the other hand, it's uh, keeping eye level. Uh, and keeping eye level means uh, that we have to uh, be on an eye level with the user, with the pro and as well with the protagonists that we are meeting and that we are reporting on. And um, I think that uh, there's in contrast, you have that, all, that old school type of uh, bird's view journalism, which uh, is important, which will always play a, a major role because users, readers, listeners, and viewers, they need orientation. But on the other hand, as our world is getting more and more complex, um, it becomes important to, to get back on the, on the eye level with the protagonist. So uh, the, to, to see the world from, from their perspective. And um, it's about radical closeness, as, as I mentioned. And um, this trend automatically leads me to the word empathy. And in fact, uh, during my journey in the US, uh, empathy was one of the most heard words. Um, I heard it at BuzzFeed, as, as you might know. One of the things that BuzzFeed is very, very good at doing is taking those personal seeming experiences and connecting them with people more universally. Um, so it's absolutely true for a lot of the work that we do, both in the entertainment side of BuzzFeed and on the news side, that there is this element of empathy. We really want to have a real impact on people's lives. So that's their definition of empathy. And I heard it also <laughs> at, the, at the next uh, place I went to. I heard it at uh, YouTube. It's wonderful. I there people talk about uh, various issues and try to push certain causes that are important to them and also important to their audiences um, or become important to their audiences as a result of kind of raising that awareness. Um, so I do see that happening quite a bit and I think YouTube has been a really powerful tool in, in, um, in the rise of empathy and sort of the way that people um, as audience are trying to get involved. Yeah, so, so, and I heard it at a lot of other places as you will see. And, um, so everybody has their own definition of, of uh, empathy, and of course it's an old school word, but it's interesting that in this, in this media, new media world, empathy um, becomes such an, um, uh, such an uh, 
important value. Um, and of course, if you look at the dictionary, it says the feeling that empathy means that it's the feeling that you understand and share another person's experiences and emotions and the ability to share someone else's feelings. Um, so what does that mean for journalism? I do think that virtual reality has the potential to do that. In fact, I think that it's much easier in VR to accomplish this. It's easier than if you compare it to, to classical media. Um, and as I already mentioned, virtual reality is one of the most discussed and hyped uh, uh, terms right now because it's, uh, again, it's an, a very illustrious mix of, of, of people who are heavily investing in that technique. You have, on the one hand side, you have um, the gaming industry, you have the advertising industry, you have the porn industry, you have, uh, you have science, you have theater. And, and also journalism, and they all, uh, they are interested. And as this is such a big alliance, this might be a reason why at the end this kind of technique will maybe have a, a bigger impact on our life as, for example, 3D uh, um, has, like, I guess many of you maybe have a, a TV device that can do 3D, but nobody that I know actually uses it. Um, so, um, and on the other hand, the reason why this become, might become, beside the fact that there's a huge business going on, uh, is that you can get reactions like this from VR. <laughs> so what do you think? Oh, you're crying. You're crying. Gina, you're crying. Should I stop? Do you want me to stop filming? Yes. I'm stop filming for me too. And th this lady was just watching uh, f not fictional contact, uh, content. She was, uh, she was watching um, uh, a documentary, uh, a journalistic content. And uh, yeah, and you see uh, the people, they react and uh, sometimes it's strange. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, b before we watch a really short excerpt of documentary film that the VR company Verse, one of the major, the biggest, uh, and really great company, um, has done, let's hear what their CTO says about VR and journalism. What we found is that virtual reality has the ability to place people into these spaces that they would otherwise have no access to in a, in a way that gives them connection to the people um, in a much more visceral way than you get through separation of a traditional screen. So uh, when somebody looks at you in virtual reality, you, you kind of feel as though you're sharing the same space with them, and that makes you relate to them in a deeper way and have a greater sense of empathy for, for them and the condition that they're in. Yeah, as you, you will see, uh, his, the company's name, they, they just changed it a few days ago. For, formerly it was known as Verse, now it's called Within, which gives you already a clue of what it's all about. It's being within these world. Um, and um, now I want to show you a really, really short excerpt um, of one of their works, which you might know, hopefully you don't uh, know that already. Um, it's, uh, unfortunately, I haven't uh, these hundred pairs of Oculus Rift goggles that I can borrow, use so that you can watch it with a, with a headset. But uh, so you see the whole 360 degree video. And uh, this video is uh, something they did and which scored really good for a younger audience as well. It's called, um, the, the project is called Waves of Grace. And it's about um, the, the largest Ebola outbreak in Liberia. And, um, uh, and it's, it's about a, a woman uh, who uses her immunity to care for orphan children in her village. Help us to be your angels on earth. Help us to do your will, even when we fear it. I remember the fear, the fear people had of me. They were too scared to even touch me. And I was scared of my own child. I was scared of the man I loved. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Lord, you were with me from the beginning when I became sick. 
I couldn't eat or drink. I was afraid that if I entered the hospital, I would die. You helped me through the doors, Lord, and then there was darkness. I was lying helpless, and people all around me were dying. The man I loved waited three days more than me to get into the treatment ward. I called for him. I heard his screams, but I never saw him again. brought me back to life. You raised me from the dead. Thank you for making me a phoenix, for being born again. If you would wear VR headsets, you would have experienced people look at you, you would be on eye level with that uh, protagonist uh, called Ticonti. And um, they did similar stuff um, on, uh, for example, in a, in, a, in a refugee camp in, in Jordan uh, from the perspective of a, of a young child, eight or nine years. So um, that's what, what they are doing. So let's uh, do a little conclusion. When does VR make sense? Uh, I think it makes sense when it's more than just a gimmick. And I guess there are similarities to your work as well. It's, of course, it's nice to have that, but it, uh, it only makes sense if it really, uh, from, from a journalistic perspective, it gives you access to a new world, if it gets you closer, or if it uh, gives you some, some sort of transparency. For example, if I would film with a 360 degree camera right here, you could see me on the one hand side and you on the other hand side, be maybe bored or something, and you could, could just uh, uh, walk, walk around uh, in this experience and be more transparent. Um, what we've seen was a video that was shot with a special film technique, another possibility to create v journalistic VR content is to graphically rebuild certain worlds uh, with a technique called uh, photogramming. I could just take some 300 pictures of, of this room here with my iPhone, upload it with the technique, and they could easily rebuild it in without our, uh, within hours. Uh, so that's uh, a technique which is used. This was used like you had a photo of some kind of sculpture, and, but it works as well with cities and all kind of stuff. Um, and this is also that you can use for rebuilding 3D worlds. That is all in one, instead of using five, six different software, which was necessary before to make any reality capture translated into a high quality 3D digital model that you can use for augmented reality, for virtual reality, to make a film, to make a game, to tell a story online. So, so that's, this is something how it can work, and I want to introduce you shortly to the to the work of Noni de la Peña. She's an American journalist um, from California, and she is um, she's she's called the godmother of virtual reality in, in journalism. And she is using uh, the 3D technique to to actually rebuild certain worlds and place you there. She did it with Gu Guantanamo, and uh, now on VR, she, I'll, I'll show you something. Uh, and that's what she says about VR. I think that virtual reality really does generate empathy in a way that's unique to the medium because you just, you've gone through the television screen, you know, you've jumped inside to the newspaper story. It's not as if people forget that they're here. Most people will say to you, wow, I feel like I was there and I was here at the same time. It's this duality of presence. So it's not like you're so engaged with that world that you don't know, you know, who you are or where you are anymore. It's not the case. But what it does do is allow you to feel like you're there in, in a very visceral and engaged way that can generate empathy for people that perhaps was not um, uh, going to be the case had they just read it in the newspaper or watched it on TV. So um, uh, something I want to show you, that's one of her works. It's a reconstruction uh, of uh, bombing uh, that took place in Aleppo and um, with 3D uh, glass, uh, with uh, virtual reality goggles, you would be within that situation. I do tend to pick stories where a live event, a verite event is unfolding, which, which was also the kind of highest bar 
documentary filmmaking? How do you make a veritasi and capture something live that's really impactful? So I try to use th that same precept to inform how I build these pieces. So that's the VR recreation, and you're gonna see the, the real picture. It was done from a handy video, mobile video. So I guess this technique, I don't know how you feel about this, but this uh, technique gives you the potential to be in a, in a world that you, you couldn't be in uh, before. It's much more immersive and um, that's basically what always journalism was all about. It was about uh, uh, bringing you to places you can't be uh, if it's a live coverage or something. So uh, finally, let's talk about the challenges. What are the challenges associated with this, uh, uh, this technique? The, the users moving increasingly autonomously and independently in our stories. What tasks do we, the journalists, have to accomplish um, who create these worlds? Um, uh, once again, um, let's, we'll see Aaron Coblin. He didn't close his mouth, actually. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, it's, you, you, you always have to be aware that this is a technique which is much more immersive. And um, in fact, it is used uh, by the military. Um, they're working with it to, with, with people who got traumatized, uh, soldiers. Um, they, they place you in virtual reality to, to get back into, into this world to, to fight their, their traumas. And so, on the other hand, you have to be aware that you can also easily shock people with that. And um, there will be journalists who, who use that. Uh, for example, if you look at the, at the Orlando shooting uh, that just happened, there might be eventually uh, journalists who, who recreate that world and they say, okay, it's for, for showing you how that, how that uh, shooting took place. Uh, so there might be stuff like that. I think just like any form of media, there's the potential for, for good and bad. Um, I, I think as media gets more rich and more immersive, uh, the, the potential for extremeness gets uh, amplified as well. I, immersively speaking, you're gonna see the whole picture. Uh, you're, you're never gonna see the whole picture. Both of those things are true. So, and uh, the, the, the second challenge, um, which is uh, also interesting uh, for you is the a huge challenge is uh, dramatur dramaturgy um, because um, it's like you will, when you look at all different kinds, whether it's fictional or whether it's journalistic um, works, you'll see that most of them, they are just 15 minutes or something. And that means that they have a hard time that to really engage people to, 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 to stay in the story. And it's, of course, it's exhausting. You have, still have these huge, these huge VR masks and, uh, uh, and uh, you have to find some ideas how to get people active. Uh, it's not a lean, lean back medium. So um, one, one, one chance to give you some, some might be that as it is still sometimes virtual reality, if you're into it, it sometimes feel like you're in a museum. I mean, you're on eye level, but you can't really talk to people. And this is a guy who actually did a video game. Um, he, co co he worked um, also for Grand Theft Auto, uh, which is one of the <laughs> best-selling uh, video games. And um, that's him on... Uh, journalistic products and VR and how a future could be. We have a lot of journalistic experiences um, which we can see uh, and certainly now through VR we, it, it really kind of hits the emotional buttons. I think if we can take that and elevate it to the next experience where we're actually interacting with it and we're actually making choices in it, then I think that that's actually going to leave a much more of a memorable experience for you that goes beyond that moment of when you just have the, the VR mask on. Yeah, and uh, so to, 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 to get to the, the final conclusion, I was talking to, uh, as I talked to Aaron Coblin, I asked him what his biggest, uh, he thought his biggest challenge right now is. And uh, he, I thought that he would refer to, I don't know, having codec problems, having technical problems, the huge costs. But what he said, uh, his biggest fear right now is 
this year bad content. Uh, and it's obvious because um, at first, if you if you wear these these kind of Google cardboards, you get into <laughs> these uh, worlds. Um, uh, you have to do handicrafts. You have to put the smartphone into them. You have to download an app and content for the app. And if you eventually look at crappy content, you you will be hesitant to do it another uh, further time. And that that wow effect you once have, if you wear these goggles, it will rapidly uh, wear off. And uh, you you really have to think about dramaturgy and uh, and content. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.